You are all in for such a a treat tonight as we are joined by these two fantastic authors. Caroline is a professor of French and comparative literature at Barnard College and Columbia University. Her latest book, Proust's Duchess, won the French Heritage Society Book Prize and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Biography and the American Library in Paris Book Award. She publishes widely in the non-academic press and many outlets, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and W Magazine. Katie Marin is a dedicated reader with a lifelong passion for literature. Her career has encompassed investment banking, magazine journalism, public service, and book publishing. She's a contributing editor at Vogue Magazine, an expert on public squares and urban green spaces, and an accomplished fundraiser at the New York Public Library and the High Line. You you guys, if you've not gotten your hands on this book yet, Becoming a Gardener, you have so much to look forward to. It is simply exquisite, all-encompassing. It incorporates practical, artistic, visual, philosophical views, all of what gardening can do for us personally. So without further ado, I am going to pass things over to our guests of honor, who we are so grateful to have with us today. Take it away, Katie and Caroline. All right, well, thank you for having us and thank you, Katie, for inviting me to be the one to talk to you about your magnificent book. I will say uh, by way of full disclosure from the outset that uh, Katie is a very dear friend of mine, one of my favorite people. And I've loved your past two books, but this is my favorite of all. And it's not always the case that one loves one's friend's books as much as one loves one fr- one's friend. But in this case, it really has turned out to be so. Um, so I, I can't emphasize enough what a joy this book was to read. And, um, and I hope some of that will come through tonight when Katie tells us more about it. Uh, Katie, I thought I might start with a very broad question, uh, which has to do with the subtitle of the book. Uh, I love seeing you pairing reading and digging. Uh, as the kind of the two components of becoming a gardener. Can you talk to me about how those two um, activities or aspects animated and yielded this particular book project? Because I think it's a big part of what makes it um, unique and special. Um, Gladly. And also, again, thank you to our Julia and Bookhampton. We're really excited about this. Um, To Caroline's question, I am a book lover, as Dana just said and was very involved for a long time in in the New York Public Library. Um, So I'm sure a lot of you are book lovers and would appreciate the the reading side of this, which is that a decade or so ago, I heard a quote by Cicero, which he said over 2000 years ago, which is, if you have a garden and a library, you have all you need. And I was perplexed by that comment and very curious about it. I knew I loved gardens and I've been thinking about it ever since and I've really wanted to understand what he meant. On the other side, the digging side, much more practical. Uh, Several years ago, our family bought a new house in Connecticut and it's a beautiful house made for a family who lived in it for 20 years before they sold it to us. Uh, We definitely made it our own. We made various changes, as most people do, of course, when they buy a new house. And it felt like us. But for some reason, I don't know why, I always felt like I was living in someone else's house. And I did various things. I met with the architect. I waved (laughs) sage around doors and windows, which is something I'd never done before. And somehow it just wasn't clicking in. One day I was walking our dog and I suddenly thought, well, if I root myself to the land, which is what we love most about the house, then perhaps that would root me to the house. And so suddenly after having wanted to make a garden for so many years, I had the time, I had the place and the purpose. So that's what I did. And you say early on in the book that um, the project of making a new garden became something else entirely over the course of the work that you did. Could you talk a little bit about how you started out, what your inspirations were? I mean, for book lovers, I I will say one of the many treasures and joys of this book is that you are so, um, 
you acknowledge your debt to and your sort of imaginative rootedness in a lot of the books that you've read that have beautiful gardens, beautiful images. What were your starting points and then how did your how did the enterprise change over time? I'm really glad Caroline brought that up because uh, the book is, again, in a way, two parts. It's about making the garden and what I learned as I did that. And the book mainly is about what is the meaning of gardens more than how do you make a garden. Um, but a big part of the book is weaving through the advice, the wisdom, the humor of a lot of garden writers, the best of the garden writers. And I have found generally, not surprisingly, the majority are from England. And um, they, they're all quirky individuals, <laughs> very you know, quirky, and they have very strong points of view. Um, what I did was to go to my little library of gardening books. For some reason, even though I never had a garden, I collected library gardening books, and I had several shelves. I started reading them. I wrote down all sorts of notes, and then I read the best of what I thought they'd said into the narrative of the story. So you'll you'll hear you'll hear a lot of voices in the story. And they're great voices, and some of them are really unexpected too. Um, I became an accidental uh, gardener during the pandemic because it was the first time I ever ever had enough time at my little place in Connecticut to put down any roots in that way. Um, but I didn't have the gardening library or the the um, the sort of vision that you had about how to make the books in your world actually inform your garden. And so it was really a, a, a such a pleasant surprise for me to find out that all these writers I admired for other reasons had written about gardens. So Eudora Welty, Jamaica Kincaid. I mean, the, the voices in the book are, I would say some of the really funniest ones are the eccentric English garden specialists, but there's such a kind of a symphony of voices. And I think that's part of what makes the book feel so welcoming too. You feel like you're being welcomed into a world of, of gardeners. And did you have somewhere, there's a great quote that you uh, that you cite. There are also beautiful quotations from different writers throughout, throughout literary history, including one by uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, which is what it's, tell me the garden you imagine and I'll tell you who you are. Yeah, tell me the garden you're dreaming of and I'll tell you who you are. Um, and what Caroline points out, and, and I'll just emphasize, is that most of the writers, curiously, are not writers about gardens. They're writers about all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. They're journalists, they're, they're novelists. Um, they, you know, all, all a huge range of things, but they happen to have a garden and they are so, they are so in love with their garden mm -hmm. that they feel compelled to write about it. Yeah, and I think the, the thing that struck me and I hadn't seen the, your book before it, it came out, but the, the Rousseau quote is actually a play on a very same, on kind of a common French idiom, which is, tell me who you're friends with and I'll tell you who you are. And so I love the idea that basically the garden, the garden becomes a friend. You talk about, you know, talking to your plants, you talk about the sort of the community of fellow gardeners that you enter into. So there is this wonderful, even when it's a solitary activity, when you're digging alone, one feels in reading your discovery of this, of, of this wonderful activity, one feels you supported by this community that you describe as being these many voices. And some of them are witty and some of them are helpful. And you'll take notes when you buy this book, which I think, I hope all of you will, uh, there'll be little tidbits that are useful in different ways, but sometimes they're just, you know, an amazing kind of philosophical thought or an insight that you carry away the way you would from a conversation with a good friend. Who were some of your who were some of your best friends in that world while you were gardening? Like, did you have some favorites? There are a number of people who you quote more than once, I think. Definitely. But definitely. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just seeing a quote right there by Beverly Nichols, who was a very humorous, charming journalist in mid uh, 20th century in England. He's a favorite. Jamaica Kincaid, very mm -hmm. opinionated. She's a favorite. Um, Eleanor Perenyi is a name you might not know, uh, but she uh, was a great writer and she's put down her roots in Connecticut. Um, she's a favorite. There are many, uh, I could keep, keep, keep thinking about favorites. Um, one thing that I have found curious and particularly for all those Ari Julia followers uh, tonight is that obviously, as I said, all of the, the majority of writers would be English, but of the Americans, the vast, Vast majority. So sorry, please forgive me. The, the terrible game going. Uh, the vast majority live in the East Coast, and 
the vast majority of those live in Connecticut. Michael Pollan wrote a book before he moved to California called Second Nature about building his garden in Connecticut. And it, it was curious how often uh, the writers were from Connecticut. Well, and speaking of Connecticut, and I just did what I always yell at my students for not doing, which is I left my phone on before Katie and I started. I'm very sorry for the interruption. Um, talk to us a little bit about Connecticut, actually. And uh, one of the things I love, I mean, one of the things I've always admired and appreciated about you in our friendship is just you have an incredible eye and a, and a sensibility that's very well thought out and personal, and it always has a logic to it that, that seems very simple and self-evident once it's been carried out. But when you start from any range of possibilities for how to proceed on a particular project, be it a garden or the decorating of a room um, or the choice of flowers or light fixtures, uh, there's a real thoughtfulness to it. And I think a lot of the thoughtfulness around what you chose to do with your garden had to do with the specificity of Connecticut versus the other place where you'd had a lot of trees that you love, the other place where you had outdoor space, which was on Long Island. Can you talk a little bit about Connecticut specifically and why and how that inspired you? Yeah, gladly. Uh, Connecticut is obviously in New England. And I don't know why, who knows why we all feel whatever we do. But from the time I was a young child, whenever I drove into Connecticut and saw those blue and white license plates, I felt comfortable. I <laughs> felt at home. So it was very exciting to have a house in Connecticut. Uh, versus somewhere else. It, it, it did give me that sense of roots, which I don't think about all day long, I assure you. But, um, and it's, it gave me a sense of colonial America. Uh, I think New England has that. And in colonial American, early American gardens, most of them were about vegetables because first and foremost, people needed to eat. And they were generally very attractive. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I've studied them, but I really wanted the garden to fit into its place. And to me, that place in Connecticut being the colonial garden area, an area of once upon a time colonial gardens, I decided to make it a kitchen garden, which is largely a vegetable garden versus let's say a perennial bed, which is beautiful and all about the flowers. Um, I think it suits my personality too, what Caroline was talking about. Tell me what you dream of. Mm -hmm. And I do have this, uh, I guess you describe it, sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. And um, there is that purpose of raising vegetables, which really appealed to me. And it's it's so beautiful in its execution. And the, and the book it has these spectacular watercolors and beautiful photographs. So aesthetically, it's incredibly pleasing, your, your colonial garden. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you set about doing it. How did you make it happen? I mean, you, you, there's, a, there's a, a, a really interesting section on fencing and how you chose to fence things in. And how did you choose what you put in the garden? How did you choose how you structured it, where you placed it, all of that? Um, yeah, I'd like to mention, uh, not only did I have what I came to think of as my literary mentors, but I had two real life mentors. And I, I'll tell you just a little aside. I was at Great Tide Manor and wanted to go see their huge kitchen garden. It's, it was the size of two and a half football fields. It was vast. And luckily, for some reason, I bumped into the head gardener and I asked him what would his secret be to, to gardening and to learning how to garden. And he said, watch what a gardener, a more knowledgeable gardener does and do it. And I thought that was superb advice. And I think it's so true. I have had in this garden two real life mentors who have helped me. They've guided me. Um, they have taught me a tremendous amount. One is Catherine Schiavone, who was a landscape designer with Miranda Brooks when uh, she helped us with a, a different, smaller garden in Long Island. And the other one is a woman named Gay Perus who loves her vegetables and has great technical knowledge about plants. So you can hear they have very complementary skills mm -hmm. and they were very generous in letting the decisions be mine, uh, which was important for the book and for what I was trying to do. Um, so together we all made the garden and it was Catherine I looked to a lot for advice on what sort of plants to plant. And Gay would tell us, oh, the light is good here, or, you know, you're in too much shade there. Um, 
and and why one plant might work more than another. But again, one thing I learned very quickly, and I think every gardener knows, no matter what their level, is that gardening is all about trial and error. <laughs> You'll have lots of errors and lots of failure, and that's just part of the game. And I actually think in some way a rewarding part of the game. Yeah. Uh, and you learn, you learn all the way along, which is, I think, an exciting thing too. So what, um, what kinds of things did you learn? I mean, you, the, the, your title is so evocative that somehow by digging and by reading you could, and by gardening effectively, you could turn, learn more about living. So embracing failure is one lesson learned. What were some of the other takeaways that you, that you gathered from this experience of putting together a garden? Certainly they're the practical ones. And there is a quote by Beverly Nichols that I love, which is that, he said, actually, for some reason, this is the quote I have right here oh, when I mentioned Beverly Nichols. We have a pile. This is purely coincidental. Uh, but he writes, light in the garden is a quarter of the battle. Another quarter is the soil of a garden. A third quarter is the skill and care of the gardener. The fourth quarter is luck. Indeed, one might say that these were the four L's of gardening in the following order of importance. Loam, light, love, and luck. And a huge, huge fact that I learned uh, is the importance of soil. Mm -hmm. I never expected to appreciate soil as much as I did. <laughs> and I never expected to read scientific books on the subject of soil, which I did. Um, it's a complicated subject, but it is the foundation for plants. And it is very simply, if you have good soil, you will have good plants. If you don't have good soil, no matter what you do, you won't have good plants. So from a practical standpoint, that's a big one. Um, in all of my reading, and particularly as I started out, on the more emotional side, I read that gardens provide joy, happiness, just pure pleasure in looking at the beauty. They provide a sense of escape, a sanctuary. Uh, they teach patience. They teach perseverance. Um, they hone your senses to be more aware of the life around you. And uh, over time, here and there, I, I would experience pretty much all of those, all of those feelings. And that was exciting to hear. Yeah, no, and it is, I think, one of the really inspiring things that comes through in your book and comes through in the many gardeners and gardening uh, aficionados whom you, with whom you're in dialogue throughout the book uh, is this idea that whenever you start gardening, whatever age you are, wherever you are, however much or little space you've got, that there's always somewhere really wonderful you can go. One of the quotes I really love from your book, and I've said this to you before, but is um, from Thomas Jefferson, who had uh, obviously these spectacular and important uh, gardens at, at Monticello in my hometown of Charlottesville, Virginia. And he wrote somewhere, Though, though, an old, though but an old man, I'm a young gardener. That, you know, at any stage, I mean, I feel like I was 50 when I started gardening during this pandemic. And I learned so much about, as you say, about patience, about dealing with failure, about being in a flow state and, and the pleasures of that. And it was nice to feel like at 50, I could learn something brand new. And so I, I love that you've written this book, which I think, again, um, Dana was saying to us before we got on the call that this is a book for everyone. And I think part of why that's true is that Gardening opens you up into this world of possibilities, you know, emotional, aesthetic, scientific, all these different directions that it will take you if you're receptive and, um, and there's no limit to it. So I really, that to me is one of the inspiring things about the book is you actually demonstrate over the course of the book how you develop a garden, but also all of these threads that feed into it along the way. Were there any threads that particularly surprised you? What, was there anything you, but beyond becoming a soil expert, which <laughs> as your friend, I was surprised by that too, but, um, but it's really helpful to know now. Um, what else surprised you about what you learned? Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I was surprised by how quickly sort of plants come up. Mm -hmm. And of course, at the same time, how, some never come up. But um, <laughs> one time I remember very clearly was a Friday in early September in 2019. And we had just created the beds, we had designed the layout that seemed to work well. And so we put in some late summer vegetables. That Friday happened to be a Friday the 13th. 
and it also happened to be the day of a full moon, the harvest moon. And those two together were not going to happen for another 30 years. So it was in its own way, a dicey day. Yeah. And when I learned that midday, I sort of got a little bit nervous about everyone. Um, our daughter is a horseback rider, a jumper, and she'd fallen, uh, she's fine, but little things like that happened. So I was very happy when everyone was home and peacefully safe and sound. And I went out to the garden to look at it. And I was stunned, I mean, seriously stunned to see so many vegetables, particularly lettuce, uh, up and thriving and ready to harvest. And they say that you should harvest on full moon if you possibly can. Um, that's according to moon gardening, which is something that was created many, many, many eons ago uh, in different cultures and has been used to this day. Um, anyway, uh, oh, the surprise so, of the... <laughs> Uh, this, this, so it was exciting to be able to pull up lettuces. I'd never pulled up a lettuce in my life. So imagine that and pull up radishes and pull up turnips. And, and obviously we had a great salad, but we also had a delicious turnip puree. And this is due to Gay, mm -hmm. who I mentioned earlier, who insisted that I plant white turnips and which did not particularly appeal to me, and, but she's all oh, delicious. And that turnip puree was that delicious. Um, there are many writers who will tell you that anything that comes from your own garden will taste better than if it comes from elsewhere, which makes sense, I think, to all of us. And I would say it's true, but that day was a wonderful surprise mm -hmm. and it was a day filled with joy. Yeah. No, and the, you described there's such a kind of beautiful family memory of having a family dinner uh, with all of this stuff from, from your own backyard. And I think also living in New York City most of the time, as, as you do, as I do, it's easy to start to feel disconnected from the earth and from the products of the earth. So to be in your own house in Connecticut, <laughs> pulling in fresh turnips and fresh lettuce, it's a really, it's a special thing. And it's also really interesting. I mean, you had started this project. I know you, you said you've been thinking about doing something about gardening for a long time. But the timing of it was interesting in the sense that you, you began just, you know, less than a year before the pandemic hit. And all of a sudden, all of us were at home. And I think in the early days, at least in New York, when people were washing their groceries, the idea of being able to eat stuff from your own garden would have sounded particularly appealing. So how did the pandemic play into your garden project? And what was that like to have that outlet during, during such a strange time? Well, the minute uh, the pandemic hit, we bolted to Connecticut. And at that point in the house was still very new to us. We had not slept there very many nights. Um, so we were sort of breaking it in at that time. I always felt so fortunate uh, to have a place to walk yeah. outside. And, and I, I really felt for people who are in apartments where they can't go outside yeah. and how difficult that would be. Um, but it taught me again, several things. One is that I think I was a bit naive to think that I could commute from New York City and create this magnificent oh. garden. It really helped when I was getting it established to be there yeah, all the time. And it helped, and it was a great pleasure to observe nature. A lot of people have talked about this if they have had that kind of opportunity about being around nature day in, day out and watching the changes. One writer, Rosemary Veary, talked about the fact that she could actually tell you the date of the year, depending on what was happening in her garden. Um, during COVID and that time in the spring, you probably all remember that it was a gray, cold spring, yeah. nasty spring. And we get one sunny day, but then we, were, we felt like we were back to five or six gray ones. Mm -hmm. What we had done early in the fall was plant tulips, thinking that they would come bloom and would take out the bulbs before we planted the vegetables, which timing worked great. Um, Catherine had a great idea of planting rosin uh, early, mid, and late, mm -hmm. so we would have a continual, continual sense of bloom, mm -hmm. and that was that was great. We 
We ordered different types that I liked. We threw them all into bags. We did not know what was what, mm -hmm. other than we knew that they were early, mid, or late. Mm -hmm. So we kept one row of each. And those tulips came up in the most joyous colors, the most vibrant, lively colors. And for all of us, the idea when you walked out on a gray day to see those glorious colors um, was something I'm sure we are all going to remember. It was very meaningful to all of us. Yeah. Um, how about uh, you talk at one point about having each of your each of the mem members of your of your immediate family choose a particular type of tree to plant? Can you can you talk about that because that's such a beautiful. I wish that I had, I mean, I have a husband and four dogs. I don't have any children to choose a tree, but um, that to me was such a beautiful way of kind of building your family into the landscape. You describe at one point your, your husband of, of so many years, Don Marin, as, as having been the root system of your life. So I love that you did this kind of, you had a root system that was dictated by the members of your family. What did, what did your kids choose? What did Don choose? And what did those choices mean? Um, I remember one quote off the bat by, a, again, an English woman who moved to Connecticut and saying that if you plant a tree, you've changed the landscape forever, which, you know, just tells you about the significance of planting a tree. Years ago, I read that one writer always wanted trees for her birthday instead of birthday leaves. I read that one young man wanted trees for his bar mitzvah instead of other sorts of presents. And I read that one young couple asked for trees for their wedding. So they had, those ideas had always stuck in my mm -hmm. mind. And I thought, well, again, to root us uh, to this house, why don't we all plant our own tree? And we'd have a sense of ownership of that tree and watch it grow. Um, I must say, my husband and son were not all that interested. <laughs> but, Reading they planted. So yeah. they did get a lot of guidance from me. My husband, in the end, chose an American beech, which is a Native American tree. Mm -hmm. It's a tree that a lot of you know uh, keeps its leaves year round. It's a stately tree, and yet it's a common tree. They're, they're everywhere. And in a way, that rather mirrored my husband because he was. He came from a very, very simple upbringing, and yet at the same time, he had a lot of accomplishment in his life. So it was, a, again, both. And it's also a wonderful shade tree. And I think of Don protecting all of us with his shade. Uh, my son chose a certain kind of oak, and that's a strong tree of long life, and it also grows tall. And I think William has that kind of foundation and solidity uh, to him, and he's also tall. Uh, so that suited him. Uh, my daughter and I chose trees more for their beauty. Uh, one, my daughter loves lavender and purple and lilac, and so she chose a great lilac, and it blooms all the time, and I just thought that was very, very, very suitable for her. And I chose a crab apple tree because when I, I truly think I've thought about this many times, that my very first memory in life is from being in my crib and looking outside and seeing the moon coming through a crab apple tree outside of my window. So uh, that tree has always mattered a lot to me. And um, that's what I chose. How are they all doing? Are all the trees doing okay? The trees are all doing okay. Yeah, um, uh, yeah they're doing okay. Unfortunately, as all of you in Connecticut particularly know, there's been a terrible disease of ash trees and a lot of had to come down. And it's sort of scary now that people are start talking about peach trees having an illness. So I, I worry a bit about that, but no, right now the trees are all thriving. And I love, it's amazing to me, but not surprising knowing you and seeing the book that you were able to create to hear that, you know, that that would be your first memory is the, the moon coming through the crab apple tree branches. Uh, and I think one of the things that I love about your book is that, you start out very early in the book with talking about essentially garden images and, and books about outdoor spaces and gardens that influenced you and that stayed with you as a child. And some of those are books that I loved so much as well. 
And uh, so you almost start out like in the childhood of your own existence as a gardener, but you trace its roots back to childhood. Can you talk a little bit about some of those images and some of those books that had gardens that stayed in your mind? Uh, gladly. Um, starting off, I guess, I tell you about the gardening gene, which I read about quite mm -hmm. a few times. And there's a theory that the gardening gene jumps a generation. So that would be the grandparents passing it on to grandchildren and from there on. There have been a lot of you know, stories about that happening. In our family, um, we did not have a, a garden. Mm -hmm. So I really came to gardens first through books. Mm -hmm. And one other thing I've learned about gardening is the, the need for imagination because everyone's going to have a blank slate when they start to garden and they have to imagine things. So you know, you go back to, you start thinking back to your childhood. Uh, there is one writer, Robin Lane Fox, who has been writing a column in the uh, FT, Weekend FT, some of you I'm sure know, for over 50 years. And he said, the memories of flowers stay with us to the end. And I think that's true. I write about uh, uh, Secret Garden, which is a book, book so many of us have read. And I also think, of course, about Peter Rabbit and how he quickly escapes <laughs> you know, out of the garden and, and, and the cabbages. And every so often our cabbages would have a lot of holes in them. And I think about <laughs> Peter Rabbit potentially having been there. Um, I touch on Madeline, which was a series of books I particularly love. And simply because the first book talks about the Luxembourg Gardens. And Carolina and I actually have a happy memory of being yes. in the Luxembourg Gardens together one winter day. But um, I first visited it uh, at age 23, my first visit to Paris. And I was so moved by this garden on a really cold, sunny, crisp winter day that I started to cry. And you know, I'm talking to you about roots and sage and crying. <laughs> that's not, <laughs> you're not that. <laughs> that's not my normal way. Yeah. And, um, but it, it clearly moved me so much. I went there every single time I've been to Paris ever since. Um, so that was an inspiration. I thought about other gardens of my childhood mm -hmm. that I visited and how they stuck with me. Um, so they say about gardening that, one, one writer says you get many doses of pleasure because you have the present to appreciate, you have the future to look forward to, to think about what will this plant be like in three years, a three months or three years. And then you have the past because you do go into your memory bank to remember gardens, to try to figure out what you wanna do with the garden right now. And uh, it's this wonderful amorphous way with time. Yeah. That is another thing I've come to very much appreciate. Yeah, I was really, that was a, one of my favorite takeaways from your book is that you, you speak very movingly and very eloquently about those three temporal modalities. So present, what I'm doing now, and then and you might want to talk about this if you'd like to talk about this a little more, the sort of flow state when you're in and when you're working in the garden and time, I think I told you in an email over the weekend, I went up to Connecticut where I hadn't been in a, a month or two and it was terribly overgrown. Nobody had been to mow. And I spent such a blissful Sunday. I think I was in the garden for 12 hours and it could have been one minute. It could have been five days just pulling. So that kind of intense awareness of the present is so special. But then as you say, you get these two modalities of memories of the past and imagination of the future. And to have all three of those modalities activated in one activity, I think is, is quite rare. I can't think of another one where that's, that's the case. But I, I really love the way you talked about the flow state. Can you talk about that a little bit in case your, your, our listeners aren't familiar with that concept and how that worked for you in the garden? Sure, um, that concept comes from Charlotte Mendelssohn, a writer in England uh, who's just written another novel, but she's a New Yorker writer mm -hmm. a lot. And she referred to it. And it's the idea that you are getting so immersed into an activity that you really like, that you lose all sense of time. And you just so zoned in on what you're doing. And I think to have that opportunity in our lives, which not only have so much complication and so much sadness for so many, 
but they're also very frenetic. Yeah. They're continually frenetic for everybody. And I think having that ability to sort of step back, even if it's for 15 minutes, is, is, a, is a big pleasure in life. Yeah. yeah. No, and it sounds like it, you know, it stood you in very good stead during a, during a difficult period. What are you most excited to get back to in your garden um, now? Like, what are you, do you have any plans for the future? Any things that you mentioned a few places in the book, oh, maybe I'll try that next time. Or what are the kinds of, what plans do you have for your garden? What are things you'd like to try that you haven't tried yet? Uh, we scaled it back a little because one, one important practical fact I learned is I strongly recommend uh, that if you start a garden, start small. Start smaller in a way than you expect because it will take more of your time, more of your effort, more of your thinking than you realize. You'll also, if you do happen to make vegetables, um, produce vegetables, you'll have many more vegetables than you ever expected <laughs> to have, which is a good thing. Um, but, um, Oh, just what do you want to plant? What are you oh, planning oh, to do? Yeah, so yeah, you did say that you, you delimited your space very well I in did. the beginning, but you said you were saying that you want to kind of delimit it even more going forward for this reason. Or? Well, so I did, and I also actually put in something called the cover crop, which is really just something that's very healthy for soil mm -hmm. to really restore the soil this year. But it was honestly also to save me from thinking about what I was doing with those <laughs> uh, those beds because it was a little, it was more than I could manage. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, advice and help and I worked a huge amount at it. But if I'm not able to do it every day, yeah. it was a lot. So that that is one thing I've done this year. What I'm particularly looking forward to for some reason is my grapes and my currants. Oh, okay. And, and uh, we uh, planted them around the walls, uh, the fences of the garden. And I just love them. And so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing those grapes grow and be more edible and currants to be there, uh, the raspberries to be there. Uh, and, and so funnily enough, this year, I'm more interested in the fruit than ever. Interesting. Okay. But I think that's the other thing the garden gives you, right? Is that it, the sky's the limit in terms of what you can try, at least. So you did a bunch of tulips, you can do a bunch of fruit, uh, anything is anything is possible. I was really, I really appreciated your advice about starting small too, because um, just practically speaking, as you say, like just the, the, the volume of weeds that I extracted from my very small garden this Sunday was insane. And yet when that garden isn't doing well, it feels like there's a whole, there's an infinite world and in even kind of a small space. So. Um, it's really, really thrilling. One of the things I also love about your book, and this is why uh, what part of what makes your book so special, and Dana mentioned this at the beginning, is that you touch on so many different facets of gardening. So writers about gardens, great writers who weren't gardeners, but who are writing about gardens, your own personal experiences, practical tips, takeaways like the four L's, uh, but you also intensely engage with the sort of the idea and the look and the feel of other gardens that have been meaning to you to meaningful to you to visit, and you you even come up with a little list of recommended uh, destination uh, vacations if you ever want to just go and spend a weekend visiting a particular garden and getting inspired. You have a few of those ideas. Can you talk about some of those places because they were a lot of those were really wonderful, and I have a lot now on my list to to go see. Uh, certainly, uh, one is. Uh... In, in the winter, I did this by season, and I think of the winter and Pete Udolph, who some people would consider uh, the foremost landscape designer today. Uh, he is known in New York for the High Line. And I've always, my, my favorite time in the High Line has always been the end of winter when there's that slanting winter light and you see the berries, and the grasses. Uh, and I, I think that's so beautiful that I would love to go see his garden or gardens in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. That um, I talk about Derek Jarman, mm -hmm. who has a very strong cult following. I'm sure some of you know who he was, and very sensitive man, a filmmaker. And he had a very unusual garden in a very rough area on the English Channel. Mm -hmm. And he had a small fisherman's cottage and he collected flints and, and would create these designs with the stones and plant the flowers. And no one needs a ticket to go. You can just wander in 
wherever you are. It's, it's near a nuclear plant, so you have that looming <laughs> in the distance. And it sounds rather otherworldly, and I would be very curious to see it. Um, a garden that has been an inspiration for me, particularly since I wanted to do a kitchen garden, is, uh, is Monticello. And that uh, Jefferson's garden is a thousand, what, a thousand feet long. And it would be row after row after row of beautiful plants and vegetables. He, is, uh, he loved vegetables. Uh, he grew, I think, 90 some odd varieties of peas, over 100 varieties of hidden beans. He, he, he really was more passionate, I think, about his garden, he would tell you this anyway, than he was about running the country. Um, <laughs> writing the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, university. <laughs> I think what he says, the person who does the most for one's country is the person who brings a new plant into its country. Um, of course, when you think about Jefferson, you think about all of his accomplishments, you also realize that a lot of what he did, and certainly what he did in the garden, could only have been done with the help of many hands. And of course, many of those hands would be people he enslaved. And um, I investigated that a bit. Um, I found a wonderful painting, actually ironically painted only about 30 years ago, yet it, to me it looked like it had been painted many years ago, of uh, two slaves working in the fields and you could feel the, the guts of their work. You could feel the heat. Um, to feel the thriving vegetables right beneath them. Um, curiously, many of the slaves would have their own garden on their own land, and they would tend to their garden at the end of the day after they were done with work at Monticello. And they were, I'll say aloud, I suppose, <laughs> um, to sell their produce. And I think in doing so, they carved out you know, a slight bit of independence for themselves. Um, so, you know, it's it's two edged, but it it is an amazing garden that I have never seen, and I really would like to visit. Oh, no, we'll we'll go together because um, yeah, no, and I, I learned something too from from uh, from that part of your book, and I think you wrote so sensitively and and beautifully, thoughtfully about Monticello because it is such an ambivalent legacy. On the one hand. Jefferson and his amazing inventiveness and enterprise and also just the beauty of that garden. And on the other hand, the fact that slave labor is what made it all possible is incredibly difficult to, to wrap one's mind around. And, and you write about both of those sides so well. But one of the things I learned is you talk about how actually some of the, the produce that the slaves grew were actually, was actually produce that you know, they had brought from Africa that they were able to then, in terms of memory and imagination, they were able to take that bit of home and cultivate it in the new world. And I thought that was really, really amazing. But I love that he was your inspiration for a kitchen garden. What about other gardens of your dreams? There, you talk about Nympha, for instance, which is, that's on my list where I've never been. Yeah, uh, I mentioned garden, uh, Luxembourg Gardens, which is certainly one of my two favorite places and was my favorite place in the world until I discovered Nympha. And our family discovered it, oh, a dozen or so years ago now. It is extraordinary. I so strongly recommend. Hi, Dana. I think it's probably good to wrap up. Um, anyway, it is the most beautiful garden that started in medieval times. It then lay in ruins until the early 20th century. It's a wild garden. It's a very romantic garden. It's the only time I've used the word paradise. And in fact, I was watching a video of uh, an interview with Arabella Ludwig's boy, a very legendary English landscape designer, she used the same word, uh, paradise. And it's, it's a magical, magical place. And, you know, I strongly recommend trying to see it someday. If you can. All right, well, we do have Dana coming on. Dana, are you turning us over to Q&A now? I am, We've got a comment here from Anne. Um, when she first saw the book, it was plastic wrapped. It moved her so much that she purchased it. Love the words and illustrations. Captured the magic place you go when you work in the garden. Um, which brings me to a question about the writing process for this book. As you were saying, there's so much incorporated into what we have here. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, gladly. Um, the other two books that you had mentioned earlier, and Caroline mentioned, uh, were books on city parks and city squares. They were very different from each other, but they were both the same in the sense that it was compilations of essays. It came up with the idea, it came up with the various places. I found the writers who wrote essays for the book. And therefore, I didn't write the book. And I wrote the introduction, but that was it. And in this case, I tackled writing the book. Caroline, uh, I see it in every email she writes, is a natural writer. She, she writes so fluidly, so beautifully on anything with humor, with seriousness. Um, and, and no writer does it with ease, but it looks easy. And this was anything but easy for me. And um, so it took, it took a lot. It took a lot to get it organized and get the lay of the land. And, and then, you know, it was iteration after iteration after iteration after iteration. Um, when I was doing City Square, um, one woman uh, sent me, okay, draft number 18. And uh, I would swear <laughs> that I had many more drafts than eight. Yeah. But you are, we were um, talking with your book about, uh, with, about your book with the, um, with Tony Marks, the president of the New York Public Library, not that long ago. And, and he said that what drew him in from the beginning was the beauty of the writing. And I have to say, and I said to you privately, that that was what I, I wasn't, I, I, it took me by surprise to just see the real deep beauty of your writing and the care that you took, the way you would care for a garden, you cared for the language of your book. And so it's really, the book is a pleasure to read. And it, uh, even if it takes many, I have a, a fellow writer friend of mine always has this mantra, every word hurts. So even, <laughs> even if every word hurt, the result is, uh, is something really special and very readable. And it's great that somebody could intuit that even just in the plastic shrink wrapped book, but that you'd open it up and discover the beauty of the language, which is it's a rarity and is something really special. But yeah, and, and thank you for that comment. Uh, uh, that, was, that was very nice. Um, you mentioned about the full moon earlier, and tonight is actually a full moon. Um, does that have okay. some meanings that you can share with the, the group on their garden, on harvesting, on why maybe it's a good time to harvest? Sure. Um, there is a concept which I briefly touched on called moon gardening. And it will basically tell you that you, you plant, harvest everything according to the moon cycle. Mm -hmm. When the moon is growing, waxing, it's bringing the gravitational pull is bringing moisture up to the top of the soil. And that's the time when you should be planting uh, uh, crops that grow above ground. Uh, when the full moon is out, they will tell you that's the time to harvest because all plants will be at their fullest. Then the moon starts dipping and waning. And as it does that, the gravitational pull weakens and the water comes down. And that's the time to plant root crops and crops where the growth is happening around. Mm -hmm. um, I found it very interesting. I, I read one book uh, by a man who swears that he never ever has had to do any irrigation, any watering in his garden because it follows the pattern of the moon. But there are definitely a lot of people out there, particularly, for instance, farmers in uh, France, you know, very agricultural based country which follow, uh, who follow the patterns. And there are some, for, for lovers of watercolor, these beautiful watercolors I mentioned in your book, there's one, it's a two page Love spread, that. right? Of just of the moon in its different states. That's so special. Do, yeah, um, anyway, I don't want, I had another question, but I want to hear other people's questions, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're gonna ask a little bit about soil. I know you had touched on that earlier too, and that that was one of the things that you found surprising that if it's bad soil, you're not gonna get good crops or, or good plants. Is there a tip that people should look out for as far as what's good and what's bad? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think you should test your soil and you can test it and send it to a university lab. There are a lot of them. And for a very small fee in the teens, let's say, of dollars, um, they will test your soil for you and send you back reams of statistics. 
about <laughs> what is good or not good about your soil. And then of course you get somebody to interpret it. The pH balance is, is sort of the most important fact and that you can obviously see on your own, but it will tell you a lot about what you need to do to make the soil healthy for plants. Interesting. Katie, did you have another question? Oh, did, um, oh, sorry, Caroline. Yeah, <laughs> Katie may have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't remember what it was. Yeah, I, love, I was unexpectedly blown away by, the, by your soil section. And you talk about chocolate earth, right? Can you talk about that sort of devil's food cake quality when soil is good? Yeah, uh, when we were creating our site, we took out a beat of old small basketball court and a really beat up cutting garden where there was not a flower to be had and the fence had fallen down and all. And saw the soil and it was full of rocks and it was very sandy and it was terrible. And so I found somebody who was fantastic at really digging down and layering the soil in different ways to produce healthy soil. Um, and he produced beautiful soil. It's what one writer calls devil's food cake. And one day I was there and sitting on the, on the ground looking forward to digging. And I thought, oh my gosh, this looks exactly like devil's food cake. So I, I thought it was a wonderful description. Wow. Well, believe it or not, we're already at that time, but for our readers, when they pick up your book, after they're finished reading it, what is your hope that they take away, their biggest takeaway from this book? I say two things. One is just in general, and I hadn't thought about this initially about myself, but in trying to do something new. And somebody said, oh, you know, it's great that you're doing something different and forging something new. And I think it just tells anyone, but try something new. It's fun. And, um, you know, it's just for yourself. You're not gonna, any mistakes you make, big deal. Uh, but what has also been incredibly moving to me is how many people are now telling me that they're inspired to make the garden. And they're really serious about it and what they're doing. Uh, and that I've, that I've loved. So if one or the other happens, I would say that my book has been successful. And to start small. And to start. <laughs> Very well. Thank you both Caroline and Katie for being with us this evening. What a fabulous discussion and congratulations to you again, Katie, on this spectacular, gorgeous book. Everyone Becoming a Gardener, What Reading and Digging Taught Me About Living by Katie Marin is out now. It's available for purchase at RJ Julia, Wesley and RJ Julia and Book Hampton. So go grab your copies and thank you for supporting your independent local bookstores. It truly means the world to us. We could not do what we do without you all. So happy reading everyone and have a fantastic night.